Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel Kostana Reacts where I learn all things Parad with your help and I just share my Slovak Central European point of view and in today's video I'm going to do a run video podcast um, uh, which I know you guys are all fans of but you're also a big fan of Abhijit Chatva, which is also going to be featured on this and we're going to discuss some geopolitics so I'm very curious what this is about it's a uh, an hour and a something, 40 minutes long video. So I'll split it in two parts. And in part one, um, yeah, I will, uh, full disclosure, set this speed to 1.5. Um, I know that you guys don't love it, but I also uh, see that uh, really long videos are also not that great for you. So this is the, the reasoning uh, for me behind that. And I think I'll do it with all the videos moving forward. Um, so for all of you that perhaps are not keen on 1.5, uh, perhaps may not be the right format for you. Uh, but uh, before we jump into the video, please like this video and click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, I say let's go. By now, I think it should be clear to everybody, Russia is dominating the Ukraine war. The Ukrainian armed forces horrific situation. They are now inducting elderly people into the army. They are inducting pregnant women into the army. We are talking about the world's Bobby Dale from Animal, aka China. So Xi Jinping is sitting as the emperor. He has got rid of all the opposition. Lots of people have disappeared. What happened to Mr. Ali Baba? Mr. Jack Ma? Where is he? We don't know. In your eyes, hmm. how Ooh. powerful a geopolitical power is Iran truly? Mossad has some idea of something that's going to happen. These messages are coming out. Partially out of there, the PM of the country is like talking. What is happening? And now India is conducting anti-piracy operations in the Arabian Sea region. The thing is this, a drone will cost a couple of thousand bucks maybe. And to shoot that down, you need a missile that costs multiple million dollars. We see oh, wow. drone warfare for the first time in the oh, human story. Swarms of drones. That's what the future of warfare is like. What do you think of this whole next phase of American politics? The US politics is very interesting. We have Mr. Biden who's currently the president. He clearly is not capable of running the country. Ms. Kamala Harris would be not a great candidate. So the big heavyweight is Mr. Trump. Abhijit Chavda returns on the Ranveer show with another geopolitics special. If you enjoy this combination of AC and RA, this is going to be a spectacular 2024 update for you. It's a very quick fire recap of everything that's happened last year, everything that's happening right now. And it's also a little bit about the present and future of all our countries. And I sincerely hope that it's not just Indians watching this because we've really tried touching upon a lot of different stories that are happening from all over the world. But without further ado, this is the legend, Abhijit Chavda, who turns <laughs> on this geopolitics special on TRS. 24th geopolitics update, courtesy not of news channels, but courtesy of AC back on TRS. What's up, AC? All good. Thank you for having me again on the podcast. Let's do a very, very quick fire geopolitical update, actually. All right. Very quick fire. Let's go over a gist of what's happening for people who've not been that updated, and then we can build upon from there. Yeah, this is a very interesting year, 2024. It's a year of elections. We just had the Bangladesh elections. We're going to have the Indian elections, the Russian elections, the US elections as well, and, and elections in other places as well. Uh, so it's going to be a very eventful year. We have wars going on. There's a war in the Middle East. There's a war, an older war in Ukraine. There is conflict in various parts of the world brewing. There's China, Taiwan. There's always a flashpoint. There's North Korea that's acting up a little bit. Um, the Middle East could be a problem. India and China uh, on the on the disputed border between India and Tibet, we've had some flash of some, some issues recently. There's always Pakistan, the good old bad boy, you know, the attack dog of other powers. And this Europe, there's the recession in Europe. There is so many, so much things happening. Russia is obviously, by now, I think it should be clear to everybody, Russia is dominating the Ukraine war. They are in no hurry. They are just sitting there and the Ukrainian army has destroyed, has been destroyed more or less. So they are now inducting elderly people into the army. They are inducting pregnant women into the army. The Ukrainian armed forces, horrific situation. Uh, Mr. Zelensky is, sitting, is still sitting pretty in, in Kiev. So there's so much happening right now. And uh, there could be a lot of eventful things happening this year. One hopes there are no new wars and one, hope they, one hopes there is no escalation of existing wars. But uh, yeah, we are moving towards a period of geopolitical uncertainty, chaos. There's Afghanistan, of, of course, sitting out there. There's the Middle East. There's Central Asia also. Interesting places. There's Africa. No one talks about Africa. There have been coups last year in Africa. Where? In, in Niger, for example. In Burkina Faso, there was a coup before that and so on. Um, it, so Africa, the Sahel region, the sub-Saharan, the Saharan region of Africa is essentially a geopolitical chessboard where bigger powers, France, Russia, the US, etc. are playing various geopolitical games. China is always there. It's not, it's not far away. 
So there's a lot happening in the world. I hope there is we don't see a lot of chaos. And obviously there are the elections. And when there are elections, there are all, there's always the possibility of foreign interference in various elections. Mm-hmm. There could be that. There was an attempt to interfere in the Bangladesh elections oh. and to effect a regime change over there and get Mrs. Uh, Sheikh Hasina out of power and get the other party, the opposition parties to power. It did not work out. And certain very big powers are not happy about that. They have said this is not, not a free and fair election. And they could do the same in other elections as well. So we over here, we'll have to be careful. A lot at stake in various elections. The Russian elections, more or less, we could say that Mr. Putin should win. <laughs> the US elections got God knows what's going to happen. So yeah, a lot at stake. Where do we begin? <laughs> Which part of this body of geopolitics do we actually touch upon first? Hmm. Uh, war? That's a pertinent place to begin. You tell me. What do you think, sir? Let's start in the most unlikely place imaginable. Let's start in Africa. Okay. So in Africa, there is this place called the coup belt of Africa. A coup is a... Well, it's 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 a regime change operation in which you typically this typically a textbook way of planning and executing a coup in which you take control of certain key strategic locations in a country. It's typically the communication center. Old days it used to be the TV channels and all that, the TV station. Then you you do a decapitation strike on a government, which doesn't necessarily mean killing people, but cutting off the head and replacing it with, with another head so that everything else remains the same. That sort of thing. So the, this entire region, the Sahara region of Africa, from east to west Africa, is called the coup belt of Africa, and there have been so many coups out there. And this place is dominated by France. It comes in in, in the, the Francophone region of Africa. And we, we call this because the French had big colonies, huge colonies out there in the past during the colonial era. Today, France controls these regions through remote control. How One of the means of doing that is to, by using the CFA franc. The franc, the CFA franc, it comes in two varieties, two flavors, but it's issued by the French government and the, the bank, the, the national bank, whichever, I don't remember which one. Look it up, my friends. Uh-huh. The one in France. Okay, they yeah. issue the currency. They decide the exchange rates. And these nations use that. That the currency and they pay a certain amount of money to the to the French for issuing the currency and so on. So essentially, France controls the entire economies of these nations. Okay, and there is a group called ECOWAS, econo- uh, grouping of, of it's an economic grouping of uh, Western African nations. Nigeria is one of the major nations in this. So it's a coalition which again one could say is controlled by France. So this region was historically, you know, under French domination, even after the colonial era ended. And France obviously is part of NATO, and the dominant force in NATO is the U.S. So France, you could say, is an extension is controlled by the U.S. to some extent. And France controls this region. So you can see where the chain of control comes in. So this region has had lots of coups. Every year, typically, you'll see a coup or two. Okay, it's like a a supernova explosion happening here and there if you look at a certain region of space, that sort of thing. So recently, there was a coup in a place called Niger. Now, Niger is a country nobody has heard of. It's called, the spelling is N-I-G-E-R. It's called Niger. That's a French pronunciation. That's how I use it. So there was a coup there. Um, And this nation, probably nobody has heard of it, at least in India, because we don't teach about the geography of Africa. But it's a nation that's rich in uranium. Uranium is a fissile element which is used in nuclear reactors to produce power. 70% of France's electricity comes from nuclear power, roughly 70%, give or take a little bit. And a significant portion of the uranium that France consumes to generate electricity comes from Niger. And the government that was in power in Niger was uh, friendly to the French. And now there's been a coup last year, 23. And a different kind of government came to power and they ejected the French ambassador. uh, And they are pro-Russia and so on. And there's another thing called the Trans-Saharan Gas Pipeline that is supposed to start in Nigeria, go through Niger, go into North Africa and through there to Europe. So we've had the Nord Stream bombings which destroyed the Nord Stream, um, you know, one of the Nord Stream pipelines because of which the, that abundant cheap gas that was flowing into Europe and powering the economy suddenly dried out. And now Europe has to import LNG, liquefied natural gas from the US at three times the price. So yeah. just this one coup actually caused this big economic change? So, so I'll tell you what the coup can do. So first of all, the French were buying uranium. Okay, I'll just stop right there. Like what he's saying about Nostrum, it's it's all correct and true. One thing I wanted to ask you because um, you big fans of France, you have relations, you have Macron coming on your pres- uh, on on your on the twenty sixth, you know, uh, the Republic Day. But they are still a colonial power. Very clearly, they are still you know, mining the resources from there. And I, I just wonder how does that sit with you? Because on one hand, you're, you know, like the relations between the countries are seemingly strong, but at the same time as a country that has been colonized is essentially supporting another that is still colonizing. I wonder, I, I love to know your points in the comments. And I'm from Niger. It, I don't remember what the rate was. It was like a dollar a pound. That sort of thing. And the, the market value is about 500 times more than that. 
So they were getting essentially free uranium from Niger. Now that's ended. And now it's at the market market price. Whether it's 500x or 200x, I don't remember exactly. Or interested viewers can look it up. Homework. Mm. So that's the kind of thing it is. So that cheap, almost free uranium that is flowing into France has ended. Secondly, that, that pipeline, the gas pipeline that was supposed to be built, built through Niger may not be built now because Niger is not friendly to the European powers. They are more to Russia. Okay. Mm. And Russia has a significant... Uh, you know, um, presence, let's say, let's say presence in the Sahel region, in the Saharan region of Africa. Uh, it was the Wagner Group, led by Mr. the late Mr. Prigozhin, that used to take care of all of this, you know, various operations and all that. Now it could be other elements of the Russian army, or maybe a rebranded version of the Wagner Group, that maybe in, 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 in uh, you know, all these activities, part of the, these activities. But the new government in Niger is pro-Russia and anti-West. So the uranium, the cheap uranium, almost the uranium stopped flowing. That gas pipeline may not happen. And so what we are witnessing in Africa, in all these nations, okay, is a proxy war between the East and the West. The East, I mean, Russia, Mr. Putin's, uh, power, you know, um, you could say agents, elements, all that, and France and the US. And France, typically, when something like this happens, they intervene militarily. They cross the, 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 the Mediterranean Sea with warplanes, they send troops, and they typically involve ECOWAS, the coalition, and the, their soldiers as well, which last happened in Mali, I believe, in Timbuktu and all that, just about a decade ago. But this time, France is not intervened. Somehow they have not been able to intervene. They can, but somehow they have not been able to. Maybe somebody more powerful than France instructed them, told them that this time you shall not intervene. Mm -hmm. And that is bad for the French, French economy. I'm not saying that colonialism is good. What France has been doing is neo-colonialism. But yeah, this time they have not been able to enforce what they have been enforcing for so long. So you can see France slipping away from power in Western Africa, in Central Africa, maybe mainly, mainly Western Africa. You can see Russia advancing its interests in this region. This region is rich in resources, tremendously rich, rich in all kinds of resources, okay, mineral resources, natural resources, so on and so forth. And wherever you have Russia, you're going to have China. The Chinese have been in Africa for at least 15 years. Okay, they have, um, they are good at, see, the Chinese are very pragmatic. They will not uh, talk about democracy, human rights, freedom, all that. They will work with whoever is in power. The more autocratic the government, the better it is for them, just like the US. The US also prefers dictatorships as opposed to democracies. Hmm. So the Chinese, uh, they uh, have been building all this uh, infrastructure in Africa, railways and whatnot, ports and all that, and they use that to extract um, uh, resources out of Africa. Obviously, they pay for that. Okay, they don't do the, it the way the Eastern companies do. They steal stuff. They pay for it, but they put autocratic governments in place, dictators in place. They, you know, they nurture those dictatorships, those, those relationships. Mm -hmm. And the Russians are the muscle and the guns. And the Chinese are the brains behind this, and they also have their workers and all that. So the Chinese and the Russians seem to be kind of or uh, in, uh, in in a better or more advantageous position in Africa, and the West seems to be kind of uh, losing a little bit of ground in Africa. That's what we're seeing. And then we have uh, the expansion of BRICS. So we dealt with Africa a little bit. Now we'll talk about BRICS. Various coalitions of nations. We have NATO. We have SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement. We have BRICS. We have the Quad. We have I2U2. We have so many more such groupings. We have ECOWAS. We spoke about ECOWAS. So BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That was the original grouping. This year we've had I think four more nations that joined BRICS from January one. Uh, Argentina was supposed to join, but they chose not to join, okay? But uh, Saudi Arabia has joined, which has been a tremendously strong US ally. The UAE, almost our neighbor, they have joined BRICS. I believe that there's two more nations, Ethiopia and one more nation, okay? I, I'm e Ethiopia and who else? I think the, he's pulled Check it out. out. Egypt, Egypt and Ethiopia, there you go. So imagine this, a decade ago, if you talk, if you spoke about the Middle East, you could not think of a single country that was favor favorably inclined towards India. They were all more or less hostile to India. At best, they would be indifferent towards India. Today, each of these Middle Eastern nations is extremely friendly towards India. They are very bullish on the future of India-Middle East ties, whether it's the UAE, whether it is Egypt, whether it is Saudi Arabia, whether it is Israel. So look at that. On both sides of the aisle, they are friendly towards us. Uh, uh, we have a Hindu temple coming up in the deserts of Arabia. It's going to be inaugurated on the 14th of February, if I'm not mistaken. It's coming up in uh, in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE. And the, Mr. Modi and uh, and the Sheikh, the ruler, the leader of Abu Dhabi, Mr. Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, they call each other's each other brothers. And Mr. Modi has extremely good relations with Mr. Mohammed bin Salman as well. So NBS, NBZ, both of them are extremely bullish on India. The friendship, the, not the alliance, but the ties are blossoming. And the very fact that India has been able to resist the Western browbeating, attempts to browbeat India during the Ukraine war and take their side, it has not worked. That has given a tremendous amount of confidence to the Middle Eastern nations. And now India is conducting anti-piracy operations in the in the Arabian Sea region, near the near the Strait of Bab al-Mandeb in the in, in the Red Sea, near the Strait of Hormuz, which is uh, which is the Persian Gulf and all that. And that shows what India is capable of. And these nations know that India is not an expansionist, hegemonic power. India is not going to turn up in the middle of the night and invade them. We are going to have a very robust relationship. And this has given them a tremendous amount of confidence that they can now perhaps start thinking of no longer sucking up to the, to the US, 
and they have more they have mm -hmm. a rising power that is a great friend of theirs and very respectful of arabic culture and so it's a relationship built on mutual respect mm -hmm. so the uae and saudi arabia are part of brics now can you believe it i mean they get most of their weapon systems from the us you go to their airports you will see those big uh, american made planes over there they have patriot missile systems for missile defense anti drone defense anti ballistic missile defense these nations are extremely favorably in, favorably in, in, inclined towards india so it's a major shift that just one man mr modi has brought about in the past decade in the past 9 9 and a half years that's what's happened uh so there is that and then there was the uh then we have had this uh, uh this this conflict in the middle east which is uh, we know what happened hamas uh, attacked israel i mean that's what happened i'm just i am a neutral disinterested observer i'm just saying it as i saw it hamas attacked israel it's a very big question as to how this was allowed to happen i mean israel has the best defenses in the world the most uh, state of the art uh, surveillance uh, and and espionage uh, mechanisms in the world they have mossad they have sheen a bit internal external intelligence and yet they could not do anything when these hamas terrorists cut those wires and uh, brought the walls down with bulldozers and sent paratroopers on paragliders i mean what were the israelis doing so it looks like one could say if one were naive that this is the greatest uh, intelligence failure in israeli history worse than the uh, yom kippur war but if you look a little bit deeper it looks very suspicious and very fishy okay so i don't know what actually exactly happened but this happened hamas attacked israel israel attacked gaza and we have a conflict that's smoldering hezbollah in in lebanon is also involved to some extent the other arabic nations are also i mean look nations like saudi arabia actually want peace with israel they don't want a conflict in the middle east they are looking forward to development the the king of the, the crown prince of saudi arabia mr mohammed bin salman has long term plans of developing the nation making it an ultra modern nation why not he has the resources the money the land why should he not do that the uae is extremely forward looking nation they also want to develop the nation they want to build more infrastructure they want to have great excellent ties with a variety of countries so these nations they, they desire peace and yet you have this situation uh, to their west israel gaza there's lebanon hezbollah involved there's the west bank of the river jordan which is between jordan and israel there's the golan heights so much happening there so this is a new conflict that has suddenly emerged out of nowhere and right now it's it's a major flashpoint one hopes it doesn't escalate but if it escalates it can escalate to who knows where where is the conflict going right now oh right now the conflict is kind of a frozen conflict kind of for now it's a frozen conflict there are no advance there is no advancement of the lines the lines on the map are kind of the same uh, there is a significant idf presence in gaza they have bombed uh, the hell out of certain parts of gaza there has been some military activity with hezbollah which is from southern lebanon as well between israel and hezbollah Gaza, uh, the 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 uh, Hamas has a tremendous number of very crude but effective missiles. They've built up those. They've built a large number of tunnels that the Israelis apparently were oblivious to. Hezbollah apparently has a lot of missiles. Then there's the Iranian factor. There's the Houthis in this in in Yemen who have suddenly acquired a large number of very sophisticated drones. There was a drone attack in Abu Dhabi at, on the airport. They had to activate Patriot, the Patriot missile defense systems. The thing is this: a drone will cost a couple of thousand bucks, maybe. to acquire that's that's the cost of this this equipment and to shoot that down you need a missile that costs multiple million dollars millions of dollars we're yes. seeing drone warfare for the first time in oh, human story swarms of drones that's what the future of warfare is like and what's the response to that let's say you have a aircraft carrier okay let's say you have an aircraft carrier of, of a large major nation so this aircraft carrier will have uh, defense systems missile defense and other defense systems anti aircraft defense anti missile defense anti ballistic missile anti cruise missile and it will have a ring of warships that are guarding it destroyers and cruisers and all that so it's a ring of defense systems but it's just a numerical certainty if you throw enough drones at them it's going to hit now what do you do with this multi billion piece of equipment it's so vulnerable that's why aircraft carriers these days they stay out of conflict zones they stay at a distance at a stand of distance and they hope nobody launches a ballistic missile at them because ballistic missiles are traveled way more than hypersonic speeds ballistic missiles travel at reentry speeds 22 23 23 mark why why was there an attack in abu dhabi according to you because abu dhabi <laughs> so yeah that's a good question isn't it because see abu dhabi uh, the uae is kind of a western ally even though it's now part of brick as well but it's kind of a western ally the americans have their own bases kind of you can say they have leased certain military bases in this country including and in saudi arabia as well so if you have the presence of american military equipment in a country so some some nations would see that as a fair target okay so that's the sort of thing it is and the houthis If you look at the history of Yemen, they have suffered tremendously for decades at the hands of the West. There's no other way of putting it. Horrific suffering that they have endured. The civilians have obviously borne the brunt of it. Um, there was this conflict, but still kind of on between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, in which the Saudi Arabian uh, forces were used to target uh, Yemeni positions. Uh, there are various factions in Yemen. There's the Ansar Allah faction, the Houthis, and there's the, the the other faction and all that. So it's pretty complicated. I'll not go into the details of that because there'll be a whole different story. But yeah, so the thing is this. Yemen the Houthis the Ansar Allah faction they are supported allegedly by Iran okay Hezbollah again allegedly supported by Iran uh 
Gaza, who's that? The, the Hamas? Again, Iran. And then you have elements in Syria, uh, Mr. Uh, President Al-Assad, who is, one could say, allegedly supported by Iran. There are groups in Iraq as well that are allegedly supported by Iran, wherever you have the presence of Shia, Shiite elements. So we know how things are in Islam. I mean, it's very complicated, but if you look at it from a very, very far away perspective, it's Shia and Sunni. That are, these are the two major sects, major sects of Islam. And Iran is a Shiite country. Okay, so wherever you have Shia populations, you're going to have some influence of Iran. That's typically, it, it's, a, it's a very, you know, if you were to, were to explain to a 12-year-old, that's how, that's how you, you would explain. So you, some viewers may remember Mr. Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general who was taken, by, taken out by the Americans in a, in a drone strike. He was one of their chief uh, agents, one could say, who would go to these countries and give them various kinds of support, whether it is logistical support or financial support or bring in arms, bring in fighters and so on. So there is this entire thing and Iran, it has acquired recently, in the last two, three years, a very sizable Chinese investment. One would say apparently in excess or or in the in uh, around the realms of $45 trillion. It's a 25-year strategic deal. And obviously, Russia also is involved. They are acquiring Shahed drones from Iran in their fight in Ukraine. So you can see this, this entire axis emerging, uh, Iran, Russia, China. Now, we have the situation in Syria. Uh, Syria was overrun by ISIS, much of it. They were, uh, I mean, a few kilometers from Damascus at some point in time. And Damascus would have fallen, Mr. Al-Assad would have fallen, but for the intervention of Mr. Putin. So now Russia has entered the, the chat, you could say, <laughs> and uh, they, they have uh, bolstered the government of Mr. Al-Assad. They have uh, a naval base, Latakia, I believe, and they have uh, aircraft bases and so on also. So the Russians have stabilized Syria. They have prevented this nation from being overrun by Western proxies. So you have uh, this complicated scenario in the Middle East. The Middle East is always in crisis, and the crisis is always orchestrated by, from somewhere far away. <laughs> mm. So that's that. Hmm. And I could just go on, but yeah, let's let's move on to something else if you want to. Um. Okay. In your eyes, hmm. how powerful a geopolitical power is Iran truly? Hmm. Because if you go to geopolitics 101, it basically boils down to your economic advantages, your resource-based advantages. I would argue your population-based advantages and your technological advantages. Fair? Anything else you'd like to add to this? I would say it's also it also what also matters is the quality of your leadership and its willingness to take risks beyond your territory and within your territory. Territory. That also matters. You'd say that Iran is a geopolitical power to be considered as an impactful force on the world map? Or is it a puppet for one of the other traditional powers? Mm, that's a good question. So Iran, one could say, is a significant regional power in the Middle East. They can, if they can affect what's happening in Syria. They can affect what's happening in Lebanon. They can affect what's happening in Gaza in the West Bank. They can affect what's happening in Yemen. They can affect things that are happening in Iraq as well. Through their own spy networks and their own... Their proxies. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. they've got extensions of their own forces and they have uh, significant uh, influence in various countries and it's not just soft power it's hard power also okay so th there is financial support there is technical know-how there is logistical support there's arms and ammunition support and there's also you could say military agents and maybe possibly plain clothes soldiers as well possibly okay so iran is a nation that operates beyond its borders it is willing to operate beyond its borders it's willing to take risks it has a significant look iran hasn't seen a significant war since the 1980s the iran iraq war and they have been developing their military. I'll tell you what, about half of the population of Iran is Persian. About half of it is Azerbaijani or Arab or whatever else. So you could say that Iran is kind of held in place, the government is held in place kind of by, by force. One could say. By force. One could say, one could say it's a police state. Okay, look, it's for, let me give you a very crude example. You go to New York, hmm? you'll see cop cars everywhere, you'll see cops everywhere. You take those cops away for 15 minutes, there's gonna be riots in New York, we know that. One could imagine the same kind of thing possibly happening in Iran as well, if you take away all the soldiers and all the cops. So much of the armed forces of Iran, one could say, some would say, are, are used to just enforce law and order and, and, and whatever else within the country. And, and some of that is obviously used for influencing uh, outcomes in other nations. And they have a reasonably sophisticated military industrial uh, complex. They produce very good drones. The Russians are buying their drones in large quantities. They have missiles, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles of various kinds. They have they have uh, drones and, and, and they have a good... Uh, they don't have any shortage of arms and ammunition because they have not been involved in any, in any major ruinous war. And they have China on their side because China wants Iranian oil and energy. And obviously it makes sense for Russia to also align itself with Iran because Iran is, a pro, is, is, is an anti-US power and the biggest threat to Russia today is the US. That's how just the, the global geopolitical chessboard is loaded right now. So Iran is a significant power, significant regional power in this entire region. They dominate the Persian Gulf region. They can blockade the Strait of Hormuz at any time, which could cut off half the world's energy supplies right there. Right. So they are a significant power. They have a good navy and so on. And they are willing to take risks. And uh, they're always in the state of alert and state of, you know, kind of slightly paranoid nation. 
Without paranoid them, nation. Everyone's out to get us. I mean, look at what happened to them. There's, there's a reason for them to be paranoid. The US used Saddam Hussein's Iraq against Iran to totally destroy Iran. Didn't work. But yeah, both nations were kind of half ruined by the war. And then the Americans imposed terrible sanctions on the Iranians, medicines in short supply, everything in short supply. God knows how many Iranians died in that. And even now, we, the Iranians had signed this deal with the US. The, the What is it called? The, the Iran nuclear agreement, which was uh, signed between Mr. Obama, between the regime, Obama regime and the Iranian regime. And Mr. Trump comes to power and he walks back from the agreement. And again, Iran is again a pariah, and again, there's a, there are sanctions on them. So they don't trust the West. Once you sign an agreement, you got to honor that, mm. right? A deal, a treaty. Mm. The treaty was not honored by the US, they walked back on it. So Iran doesn't trust the West, and they have good reason not to trust the West. They, and you see what happened to Mr. Suleiman. He was taken out in a drone strike in Baghdad. Wow. Uh, the US, <laughs> they are complaining about India allegedly trying to assassinate somebody on American soil, a terrorist. But they have no. They, they are very upset about that. But they are okay with assassinating anybody anywhere. They even assassinated Mr. Anwar Al Awlaki, allegedly a terrorist, maybe a terrorist, and his young son, wow. both U.S. citizens in Yemen. The Americans took them out with drone strikes. They're all citizens. They took out Mr. Uh, uh, what's his name, Soleimani. They took out Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad, Pakistan. We have never seen evidence of that, but that's what they claim, and so on. So the Americans can do whatever they want. There's a certain set of rules for them. The set of the same rules don't apply to other nations. Other nations have to. Uh, you know, dance to a different set of rules and all that. So that's a kind of double standards and hypocrisy that the Americans are renowned for. And that's kind of why they are losing respect in the world today, especially as they, because they are a declining power right now. So Yeah, so I, I totally agree with what he's saying. I, You know, sometimes I, I feel like, what if the world wasn't the US dominated? Like, how would that look like? We would have zero Kardashian, no, like, super, I'm hoping, no, like, superficial culture. It, it is just so interesting how... You know, like if you have a strong country and it can dominate how the rest of the world adapts and what is the real kind of impact of that, right? Everything just serves the, in essence that country interest and they can influence through their culture everyone else. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, but coming back to your question, that's why the Iranians are paranoid. They have good reason to be paranoid. Hmm. It's a version of the best defense is to go on the offense. Mm. Yeah, you have to yeah. like muscle up to get ready. Uh, it seems to me from the outside, cinematically so, that the Middle East is getting ready. At least Iran seems like it's getting ready. At the same time, there is conflict. So I would assume that uh, a lot of the powers around the Israel-Gaza conflict are also waking up in terms of everyone's on high alert. That's the sense that we get sitting here in India based on the news we consume through media as well as Twitter. Uh, are we on the brink of a slight ex escalation of the conflict or do you think uh, it'll just kind of stay stable for lack of a better phrase, just like the Ukraine-Russia hmm. situation? There's always the danger that this conflict could, could escalate. Right now what's happening is that there is a bit of stability. The Americans have dispatched at least two aircraft carrier task forces in the Mediterranean, one in the Mediterranean, one in the Arabian Sea kind of region, close to the Persian Gulf, but not quite there. So that they're kind of out of harm's way, but these are there. So the task force in the Mediterranean, it can always target Hezbollah or Hamas if required. So that is there. So that thing is always at the back of their minds. You have another one in, in the vicinity of the Arabian Sea region, somewhere there, which kind of, kind of is a reminder to Iran not to overplay their cards. So they have tried to impose some stability through force in this manner. The, the problem is that Iran, Israel has been trying to kind of you know, make better relations, mend fences with certain of his neighbors. It has a reasonably healthy relationship with Egypt, for example, Israel and Egypt. Okay. Uh, the Saudis want stability in the region. The UAE wants stability in the region. But there's always the problem that, you know, if there is too much of uh, Israeli action in a place like Gaza, for example, or, or, or the West Bank of the River Jordan, which is on the other side of, of Israel. And if there are lots of civilian casualties, then there will be this public outcry that these nations' leaders would not be able to suppress and they would have to act on it. If such a thing happens, then one could, so this is the extreme scenario I'm telling you, an asymptotic scenario, extreme scenario. If something, if, if it goes beyond a certain point, if certain red lines are crossed, let's say like that, then one could see a scenario in which all the Arabic nations are forced to gang up and move on Israel. There's always the other angle, which one doesn't talk about, which is Turkey. Now, Mr. Erdogan, he has imperial ambitions of his own. He has dreams and visions of reviving the Ottoman Caliphate, the Ottoman Empire. Oh, no. He's active in Syria. He's active in North Africa, the Turkish group. Come on. I did not know that. You know, did you know that we had Turks here as well? Like, this was a heavily Turk-occupied region, Slovakia. Jesus, what is wrong with people? Like, what is wrong? Just live and let live. Honestly, why is everyone expansionist? I don't know. I, I'm honestly struggling to understand what on earth is happening. Can we just like instill more love into people? Because 
I feel the world needs that. <laughs> They occupy about one third of, of Cyprus, which is an island in the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean. So they also, and they obviously, Mr. Erdogan and his party, they express unstinting support for the Palestinian cause and all that. So there is this kind of dangerous neighborhood where everybody is kind of hoping nothing goes wrong, but everybody is prepared. If something happens, we go all in, that sort of thing. And the problem, the danger, the real flashpoint is that Israel is a nuclear power. They are an undeclared nuclear power, but everyone knows they have a number of nuclear weapons. Let's say three figures. And they have something called the Samson option, which means that if all fails, if all the missile defenses fail, and if we are about to be overrun, they will not go down alone. They will take everybody down with them. And that is a nightmare scenario. So yeah, it's it's a major flashpoint. And it, it all it just takes one misstep by somebody, one bad decision by some leader, or just some, some accidental occurrence that could trigger off something really bad. So the Middle East is in that, on that knife edge right now. Dangerous situation. Hmm. Uh, the reason I'm even asking you this question in the first place is because I think recently one of the cabinet ministers of Israel actually made a statement against Iran. Now the thing is, uh, I would argue that a cabinet minister in a phase like this is a diplomat in many ways. And the messages you send out to other nations at the time of strife are thought out. It can't just be an emotional outburst. Mm -hmm. So I believe he said something like, um, we'll come for you, Iran, or something like that. Just type, uh, Israel ministers... Message to Iran. Did you see this? Statement? I haven't seen this. No. I haven't. So it's kind of like what the Turks do. They keep reminding Greece. They could turn up one night. Yeah. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu issues... To, oh, it was Netanyahu? Okay. Then that's even more intense than what I was saying. I believe it was just a... I thought it was a cabinet minister. Apparently it's the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Who issues stern warning to Hezbollah and Iran. Do not test us. Israeli Prime Minister has delivered a forceful warning to both Hezbollah and Iran, cautioning them against any provocative actions. Oh, this is in October. Something more recent, perhaps? Some, sorry, something recently has also happened. Mm -hmm. Either way, my point is, they are sending these strong messages to Iran. Obviously, the Mossad has some idea of something that's going to happen. These messages are coming out partially out of there. The PM of the country is like talking. Mm -hmm. What is happening? Yeah, so there is this wonderful, there is this interesting, not wonderful, interesting dynamic between Iran and Israel. So Iran calls Israel, no, they call the US, Shaitan Ebuzorg, the great Satan. And they consider Israel to be an extension of the US or the other way around, whichever way they look at it. Mm -hmm. So the Iranian regime, they, well, their stated objective is to eradicate Israel from the map of the world. Okay, that's the kind of thing it is. So Israel sees Iran as an existential enemy. And I'm sure it's vice versa as well. So we have heard the news of various Iranian nuclear scientists dying, you know, mysterious, mysterious deaths and all that. So it looks like Mossad has its hands in Iran. They even took out a nuclear reactor once. Was Iraq in Iraq it was? Uh, I think it was the 80s or something. So the Israelis have these capabilities. They have a very powerful air force. They call it the IAF, the second IAF. We are the first IAF, they are the second IAF, and so on. So there is this great amount of animosity, almost a kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's like these, these two are mortal enemies. So whenever something happens via Hamas or via Hezbollah or via somebody else, the Israelis probably know and they assume that it's coming from Iran. And they may take some actions to, to you know, retaliate against Iran itself, possibly. Maybe in a covert manner, maybe in an overt manner. If there's an overt war between Israel and Iran, it could be nuclear war. I'm not sure about where Iran stands on the nuclear scale. But I would not be surprised if they have gone past the nuclear threshold by now. Because they had reasonably good uh, uranium enrichment technologies, you know, those uh, centrifuges and all, in, under the Natanz, in the Natanz facility under a mountain and all that. And the, the entire nuclear deal was designed to prevent Iran from going nuclear and giving them certain incentives not to do that. The nuclear deal collapsed many years ago. Maybe they have gone ahead with the enrichment program and they may have sufficient uranium by now, the, the enriched form of uranium, weapons grade uranium, to have a few nuclear bombs. In the, if that is true, then we have two nuclear powers, two undeclared nuclear powers. If they go to war, it's like all bets are off, you know? Yeah. Can you pull up the map of the Gulf? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. No, no, that, that one's fine. That one's good. Uh, okay, so Israel on the right is... Jordan, Iraq, and then Iran. So for Iran to actually take on Israel or vice versa, you would have to cross all these countries. Yeah. Israel is not going to be able to cross all these countries. They may be able to. They may be able to. They can. Do you think they'd be able to cross Jordan? Look, Israel, I believe, has F-35s, which is a stealth fighter. F-35s. They also have F-16s, which are a decent fighter. They can fly low or they could hack into the defenses of these nations, the radar defenses, if it's possible. Maybe it's possible. And just fly through and do it at night. No one sees. No one knows what happened. If your radars aren't active, you will not know what happened. It happens, you know, it's possible to do that. So they have good aircraft, they have good tactics, they have good strategies. They could be able to reach Iraq, Iran. The Israelis could. It's a matter of half an hour, maybe a couple of hours, maybe an hour or so. Hmm. Supersonic speeds, you know. 
when when you see this map mm-hmm. as a geopolitical observer what do you feel <laughs> it's it's a loaded just board over here it's a loaded just board every nation is like very uh, certain nations like saudi arabia oman the uae the desire peace they do not want any conflict they want development they have so much money they want to use it to further the nation and have a great future but then you have the situation the israel versus the arab nation situation has been around since the 1940s maybe before that maybe before that and then you have then you have the iran versus saudi arabia angle as well because one is a shia nation one is a sunni nation these two nations are at longer heads the saudis are scared of iran the iranians are scared of saudi arabia Saudi Arabia has this massive military. They have this massive military budget. They acquire so many, so much weaponry and etc. All that from the U.S. The Iranians have Russia and China on their side. What who knows what they are acquiring? Ooh. So yeah, it's it's a dangerous situation at the best of times. Oh yeah. Hmm. I remember one of our past podcasts. We tried breaking down what the actual cause of war is on a primal level, hmm. and it almost always boils down to either religion or acquiring more land slash resources. Hmm. Right. Um. the religion part i understand you know one sect versus another one religion versus another what about this other side land and resources that has to be an angle if not for the gulf countries then for the countries which are bigger geopolitical powers hmm. america russia china uh, do you want to talk about that from an israel gaza uh, conflict standpoint because i think at this point everyone knows just like the ukraine and russia war it's not just two countries at war that is just not how wars have happened in the last 500 years 200 years at least yeah have i said something wrong no you're not mm-hmm. so one has to understand these conflicts in the in the larger scheme of things the, the global scale so if you look at the globe as a whole there is one dominant power right now the empire the us empire which is nothing but a continuation of the british empire which occupied india for 200 years so in let's say in 1958 let's say the capital of the empire moved from london uk to washington dc that's what happened but the entity is the same it's the same empire so they control the world via what they call the rules based world order and via their extensive military capabilities so the us is the only superpower my definition of the of the term superpower means a nation or an entity that can intervene militarily anywhere in the world at 60 minutes notice only the us can do that china or russia cannot do that of course they can send missiles but that's not the point hold and occupy and, and control uh, as opposed to just destroy so the, only the us can do it and the americans have military bases all across the world including the middle east japan is under permanent us military occupation so is south korea there are more than 130 permanent us military bases in japan maybe close to 100 or maybe more than 100 in south korea lots of bases across the middle east you could say israel is an american outpost or maybe you could argue the other way around is the truth whatever it is right so all of this and if you look at the lines on the map if you look at the middle east the lines that divide nations these are typically straight lines human political boundaries never evolve like that these are artificially drawn straight lines on map somebody said took a map and drew lines on them but what that does is it divides communities it divides divides ethnicities it divides religions puts wrong the the wrong people that don't belong together together in a nation which causes civil wars and that's actually perhaps and you see the same thing in africa africa has this history of civil war after civil war which actually is great if you want to neo colonize a country and control it from far mm. so all of these conflicts look if you look at the history of the past 500 years most of the conflicts have been driven by the west initiated by the west or exploited by the west initiated and sustained by the west okay so that's how it is so this is what we are seeing right now is nothing but a legacy of colonialism if you look at how these nations were created you know the crucial state i'm not going to that but you know these blinds of the map how they emerged in the middle east for example so it's all done by the western powers mainly the british the french had some involvement in all that okay there was a division turkey was a, uh, supposed to be carved out by the western powers didn't work 1920s a long story so what are the your question boils down to what are the triggers for war what are the causes for conflict war is nothing but the culmination of a conflict but conflicts can simmer for a long time without actually going kinetic and ballistic mm. so for example there is this frozen civil war that we have in the subcontinent india pakistan mm. what is the cause of that right there are religious causes there are there are geopolitical causes the british exploited they created accentuated and exploited religious divisions within india within ancient india the subcontinent mm-hmm. partition india the way they wanted it and they favored one side over another mm. and used what is temporarily the nation of pakistan as a potent counterbalance to india and also as a geopolitical staging point for intrusion into the central into central asia afghanistan and so on so and and that was done by the british but it's been continued by the americans i mean i would not be wrong at all to say that the americans funded and financed pakistani terrorism in india for several decades okay that is absolutely 100% a fact so that's what they've done they've created conflicts they've instigated conflicts and they have sustained those conflicts and exploited those conflicts for personal gain and that's what we are seeing over here so there are so many causes for conflict but it's typically it boils down to human nature to the basest of human desires 
what do we want? What, I mean, if you were a caveman, what would you want? You want more power. You want more people to obey you. You want more territory, more resources, more money. You want more, more, more. And we humans, uh, the end of the day, are a violent species. Look at our closest cousins, the chimpanzees, brutally violent. Now, we have something called culture and civilization that kind of holds us back. Some of us do. <laughs> Some of us don't. But yeah, that's how it goes. So yeah, there are so many causes, but it's, it all boils, boils down to greed, the desire to control more and more and to essentially own the own world. Uh, long ago, when we had one of the first conversations, I said geopolitics is a sport. The, the objective is world domination and there are no rules. You make up rules as, as you go. That's how it goes. Hmm. Okay, I'll just cut it right there. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I think I could not agree with him more, what it, the complex and what it boils down to. I think it's all about the nature and, uh, of, of a human and... This is why, again, <laughs> healthy. I, I, I feel like I'll keep it hammering this time and time again. And I think I'll just, before I state it, I'll stop sharing the screen because I feel like I'm going to cut this video here. Um, is and that you know what, like how unevolved as a species we are, and that um, the yeah the desire and and the greed in people, and I think it's essentially essentially uh, ego right it's it's really like a male ego really driving that which is uh this is why i think i said in another video we uh, we live in a man-made world and we obeyed by the rules and of of a man of the the man masculine energy and uh, that is the kind of forceful dominant you know, uh, this is why in the world we have balance. This is why we have feminine and masculine. But what happens to the world if it is just literally dominated by those values? It's it's not healthy. And then what I tend to talk about is the fact that we as humans need to develop. We need to work on ourselves. And as sad as it is, we live in the world where people there are in the positions of power because they are driven by the power. Um, are really, yeah, uh, they, they, they perhaps are, are hard, highly personally unevolved. If you are, if you work on yourself, really work on yourself, which again, I think I, I mentioned it a couple of times, I think that India does not really understand or knows much of the concept of psychology and, and work uh, and that type of, uh, you know, you might have spirituality, but I think that, that part is not something that is actually present much in India from my understanding, but that's actually super important to know. And, and spiritual, and, and the thing is, even if you don't have that, you have spirituality. And if you just to work on these concepts. It is about improving yourself as a person. So uh, I think that the number one thing that anyone should be doing instead of watching geopolitical videos, you know my opinions on that, um, is to work on themselves, is to actually watch, watch content that helps you become a better person. I think that should be the number one thing before watching anything else and learning about anything else as to getting to know yourself and, and improving yourself as a person. Now, if everyone works on themselves, um, we would see a better human beings all over the world and no wars at the, as the end game, right? So I might be simplifying it a bit, but that's uh, kind of how I see it. And uh, yeah, um, I'm going to say something very unpopular. I was I, I felt like I'm going to fall asleep during this podcast. <laughs> uh, somehow it was so uninteresting. Uh, I don't know if uh, done other podcasts and they were. It felt very much more engaging. I felt like literally nothing. I don't know. <laughs> it will be very controversial of me to say, but I actually decided I'm going to say what I what I really think, and uh, and very curious if the part two of the video is going to be a bit more engaging for me. But for me, it was just incredibly boring. Um, yeah, I said it. It's a fact. I hope, though, it wasn't as boring for you and uh, that you actually enjoy watching this with me. And if you did, please give thumbs up, share, like, and subscribe to this channel. And I will see you in a part of this video, part two of this video, very soon. Until then, please do take care. I'm sending much, much love. Bye-bye.